All right, guys, so welcome to the second video. Um, this video, we're going to be going over everything on how to load our audio data and prepare it for training to be batched into our neural network. So we're going to be going over file structure. We'll take a little bit of a look of how Capri works. And then most importantly, we're going to go over how to build a data generator in TensorFlow 2.0 and making sure that you kind of understand the ins and outs of that and we'll we'll run a little bit of code and talk about all these different things so in this first slide um, we're going to have a directory that's called wave files and within here we'll be putting all of our audio data so um, the directory wave files each of these will have a directory and these directories will be the different classes that you're trying to classify so there's going to be 10 classes and if you wanted to swap out your data you would just delete these directories, uh, make new ones for the classes that you want to use, and drop your files in there. Um, the files you're going to be dropping, I would really recommend to use WAV files, um, as these are uncompressed audio, and they can be loaded into RAM like extremely quickly. If this was like an MP3, there's probably a world where you could write a bunch of multi-threaded code that's going to like be able to dedicate all the processing required to uncompress those like in a reasonably fast time, but I really don't recommend it. Um, obviously, like the downside of using WAV files is that they're uncompressed and they're going to take a lot of disk space up, but this is how I'd, I'd recommend it. And from the previous slide, we talked about using, uh, you know, these are 2 to the 16th, 16 bit audio, so the data type is going to be NumPy in 16, and that's the range. So one issue that comes up when we talk about audio classification, and especially with this data set, you see it a lot. Uh, you'll see a lot of audio, like, I think this is actually a guitar. And then eventually the magnitude becomes so low that we'll have a scenario where a lot of the signals will look the same just because there's a lot of dead space in the audio. So one way that we can remove dead space in audio is constructing something called a signal envelope. And the signal envelope is kind of meant to just track the signal and see how it changes. Um, but don't, don't see how it changes like instantaneously because this signal is rapidly crossing the X axis. So if you just said, hey, take, take out all the points that are below um, my threshold, which is going to be 100 here. So if it's below 100, just remove it. And what would happen would be that you destroy the signal completely because there's going to be a lot of points taken out here, 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 here that shouldn't have been taken out. So the way we can think about this is we can take the absolute value of our signal. So now we're just getting the positive portion and we can use a rolling window. Um, the easiest way that I've found to do this is in pandas. You can, um, so let's like, let's say the signal is Y. We can convert this signal into a series, apply the absolute value, and then just call this dot rolling method um, with a certain window length. And you can play around with this window length. Um, but this rolling window is based off of the max. So we take the max as uh, the rolling window goes across the signal, and what you get is this you get a signal envelope and you can play around with these numbers yourself but if that value of the envelope falls below our threshold then we remove it and so this allows us to remove we'd be removing all of this dead portion of the signal and i'll show you guys that when we actually go to run the code all right so now let's talk a little about capri um, so capri was made by um, this guy I, I don't know how to pronounce his name but uh, he made it a couple years ago when he was doing his PhD. And I think now he works at Spotify in New York City. Um, but he still maintains the library. And um, he also wrote a short publication about it. And it basically says, like, hey, I've got a five layer conf net. Let's compare the processing times where we compute a spectrogram um, in addition to that conf net. And we'll, we'll do it on the GPU. And you notice that. These processing times only they increase marginally. It's not really much, right? Um, and so it opens you up to this concept of just computing a lot of these frequency transforms on the fly on the GPU. Um, and the nice part about it is it can be implemented as just a, a single layer that you can add to your Keras model. So it's very simple. Like you don't have to go. I mean, 
TensorFlow Signal has all the functionality within it, but you'd have to write your own custom layer in Keras, and that's what he's done here. Um, and it's, it's very beneficial. So if you don't do this, you'd have to compute the spectrogram offline, and then you'd have to store and make up a whole bunch of disk space for that, and then you could train on it. And if you don't do that, then you like if you wanted to change a parameter, maybe you want to change um, NDFT. Well, guess what? You're going to have to go back and you're going to have to compute all that offline again and then retrain. And depending if your data is really big, it's just going to be uh, not friendly for iteration. So that's why typically when I write things, I prefer to use Capri and I, I think it does a good job. So another interesting thing is that the channels are first here, not last. So we're using mono signal, so it's going to be one in the front here. And uh, yeah, you can play around. There's a lot of uh, different things you can tune, and we'll, we'll kind of go into this in the next video where we talk about modeling. Um, but there's also a, a normalization layer that he provides. And I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about it in the next video, so don't worry about that for now. So this slide is probably the most important because we'll be talking about building a data generator. So 90% of the time when you guys write machine learning code, you want to batch that data on the fly as opposed to uh, holding all the variables in RAM and then serving up to the model. We would just like to give me like 16 samples, compute gradient descent, and then keep going until we reach the entire epoch. And so the way it's kind of recommended for TensorFlow to build this, at least from, from Keras's perspective, is we will inherit from the sequence class, which is basically uh, a class that can batch data and then it locks it out with a, like, uh, yeah, I mean, it locks it out with a lock and then it lets you train with multiple GPUs. Um, so it's, it's a safer way to batch your data for multiprocessing if you wanted to do multiprocess training. So there's three methods that we need to implement. Their length, get item, and on epoch n. So length is very simply the number of batches per epoch. So you'll have your total number of samples, and you're going to divide by your batch size, which could be 16, 32, 64. You can change this however you see fit. Um, and then we'll have a get item method. So I would really recommend that you actually check out the documentation for this sequence class and read it because you'll find that sequence actually implements an iter method. And the iter method is what will actually yield this batch to the GPU. Um, you could go read it. And so, but in order to yield that, it needs to call your get item method. So your get item method is gonna return two things, it's gonna be your X matrix and your Y matrix. So your X matrix will be your audio data in a time series because this is gonna Again, remember, like we're inputting into, and I can show you guys here, we're inputting into this MEL spectrogram. And so this expects, you know, one channel and then 1600 data points for one second of data of audio um, time series data, right? So when we do that, batch size will always be like our zero at dimension. And again, remember our input was one by 1600. So in this case, it's going to be um, our sample rate, which is going to be, and I actually downsampled. So like we've been talking a lot about sample rate. I, I downsampled to 16 kilohertz because a lot of the time you do not care about high frequency components within a signal. So your sample rate would be uh, 1600 and your delta time would be, uh, I made it one second. So you can change this, but... I used a delta time of one second. And that goes back to the other video where we talked about, you know, we're going to have one second of data, so we're going to have 100 time steps. So our, our actual X matrix would be, let's say I have a batch size of 16. That's going to be 16 by 1 by 1600 because delta time is going to be one second. And then we have our output. So because we're doing classification, uh, in fact, there's going to be you know more than one class to classify so the output is going to be a softmax layer and within a softmax layer that matrix is going to be have to be what's called hot encoded so if you don't know what a hot encoded matrix is just go google that there's some really good results on google images that will kind of make it really obvious 
Um, and it will be shaped of like batch size by n classes, which will be 10 in our case. Um, and also remember like NumPy n16, again, this is time series data. This will get converted to float32 internally. And so our output is actually going to be a floating point number where, you know, we're trying to predict a one, but realistically you might get something like 0 0.8 or something. It's a floating point. And then the last method will be on epoch n. If you want to do any kind of data augmentation, um, the only thing we're going to be using this for is to shuffle the data in between epochs. So we get a different distribution for the next batch. And um, yeah, that's about it. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll head over to the code now. We'll kind of talk about running and implementing a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. All right, so let's head over to GitHub and we can actually start running some of this code. So um, feel free to clone this. And I'm gonna assume you guys have Anaconda installed and you know how to set up your environment, but there is uh, some setup instructions here that should be helpful. The main dependencies are like TensorFlow 2.0, Capri, Librosa. Um, that should be most of it, but the easiest thing would just be to install from the requirements.py. Um, and actually, let's look at clean.py first. So if you go all the way to the bottom at the argument parser, we'll have uh, this wave files directory, and this is where we'll put all of our audio data. If you want to use your own data, this is where you would replace it. And we're going to go to a destination route. And so the whole point of clean.py is to downsample the audio and remove any of uh, any dead space in the audio with the threshold detection um, using the signal envelope that we talked about in the slide. So um, everything's going to rebuild at this delta time duration that you can set here. And right now it's set for one second. Uh, and the sample rate, so right now it's like 44.1k, but I want to downsample that to 16k. So that's how you set the sample rate here. And there's two, so there's two functions of how this code works. You can either test a threshold or you can split your wave files and you'll split um, all the files within wave files. So the first thing you want to do is figure out a threshold that will work for you. So you can see it's not commented out and you can put the base. So this is going to be the substring that we're going to look for within wave files. So it's going to go through all these, find the wave file that you want to use for threshold detection and you can preview that. So, and you can set the threshold. Again, remember we're using NumPy N16. If you're using a different data type, then you might want to change this accordingly. So now uh, I called my environment audio and I'm going to run clean.py. And there's our signal envelope for that specific wave file. Um, I think this is the exact same that I used in the slides, but Yep, you can see the signal envelope. Eventually, once the uh, envelope drops below the threshold of 100, then all of this is read, and all of this will be removed when we actually go to clean the audio data. So now, let's go back to clean.py. And once you've found a threshold that works for you, you can start to split your waves. Um, and so, yeah, you'll notice that the clean directory does not exist in here yet. But let's run this. And so uh, this progress bar is for each folder that it has to go through. So there's going to be 10 of these. And if you go over here, you notice that it's just generating all these files. And if we actually go in, we'll notice that, uh, you know, this is the same file, but there's different. So this is like the first second, this is the second second, so on and so forth. If we actually inspect these, you'll see they're one second in duration, mono channels, and the sample rate is 1600. All right. And so I'm gonna let this finish and I'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about the data generator. All right, so I've opened up train.py here and we can start by um, kind of just explaining this data generator class. So the input to the generator will be all of the wave file paths and their corresponding labels that go along with them. So this is now going to be looking at the wave files that we just created within clean.py. And let's take a look. So at the end of the constructor, we call on epoch n. If you go down here, this will generate 
uh, the indices, which is basically just a bunch of numbers from zero to the number of wave paths that we have or the number of wave files that we want to load. And then we can shuffle. So at the end of every epoch, we will shuffle these indices. Um, so the way this works, and if you look at the sequence class, if you look at the actual documentation, you would see that there is an iter method, and that passes an index to um, specify which index um, from the batch that it wants. So like there's a bunch of batches. The number of batches that we have in total is what will be the length of this length. Um, it is the total number of files divided by batch size, right? And so iter is just going to call get item. It's like, hey, get my data for this specific batch. And my favorite way of doing this is to predefine the matrices up front because, you know, Python is not a, a typed language. It's not very explicit. And it's very rare that you get something where... <laughs> the data type is already predefined, and the shape of the matrix. So this is kind of my favorite way of doing it. Um, and again, uh, the shape is batch size by one for mono channels, and then we have our sample rate multiplied by delta time. And our output is going to be batch size by number of classes because this is a hot encoded matrix. And the way to create a hot encoded matrix is to, uh, an easy way to do it is from, where is it? TensorFlow, Keras, Utils, to Categorical. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just taking my label encoded labels, um, forcing it into the number of classes, and that'll make a hot encoded matrix. And you just fill up your, your wave file and your labels. And so that will actually go into and run through your models. Let me come down here and uncomment this so you guys can see. And I'll just print maybe the first few entries and labels. And then, so when you actually go to call the, the data generator, you can create this object and you pass in all the stuff you need. And if you actually wanted to see it, you could say like 4x in training generator, print x, let's print, eh, let's just print all of x and then we'll print x.shape. You can see that. Oh, and also I guess, it's going to be hard to see, but we can also print the length of that generator. So if I come over here, oh, it's a tuple. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, well, anyway, we can still see. So um, this is our labels, right? So this would be, I mean, I only showed the first 10, but notice that they're all integers and the length of our training generator. So the actual thing is like 70 something, but I do a train test split right here. So I think the remaining like six or seven are within that validation generator. And you can see the data. So it was actually returning a tuple and I did print it. So this would be your X-ray and here's your hot encoded Y matrix. And of course it doesn't have a shape because doesn't have one. It's a tuple. Um, but yeah, that's how you would kind of start working with the training generator. And that will batch all of your data until eventually the length is met. And then internally, it will call on epoch n and it'll, it'll shuffle everything. It'll just keep doing that for the number of epochs you want to train with. And I think that'll do it for this video. In the next one, we're going to start talking about the actual modeling. So what models are available, we'll talk about like conceptually how they work, and then we'll try training some models.